going to share scripture from a couple different places this morning. Um, the main, main part I'll share is Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. But before I go there, just wanted to, uh, to think on a couple things. One is that how over time, and we've seen this throughout history, that even though we may be walking with the Lord, that over time we tend to stray away from truth. We saw that with the nation of Israel, that they would have these peaks and valleys in a relationship with the Lord, that they would be obedient and they would honor the Lord, and they'd prosper, and then they would go into a valley where they would begin to worship idols and go after other things, and they would forget the word of the Lord. And we saw this happen over and over again. So with this in mind, we're going to look at some things. Let's open with prayer. Lord, we thank you, Father, as we look into your word. Lord, that we would each and every one of us give authority to your word in our lives. Lord, that your word would be the authority in our lives. Lord, as I speak this morning, Lord, I pray that it would be your word that speaks through me, that your Holy Spirit would quicken and make alive, and that I would not speak from my flesh, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. One such case of someone or the church getting far from God happened back in the late 1400s, early 1500s, and we call that the Reformation. And I don't know how many studied about the Reformation. I know Tyler's very, very studied on that. But the Reformation was a time when Martin Luther realized that the church had forsaken truth. And he had his 95 thesis that he nailed to the door of the church in protest of how far from God that the church had fallen. Now, you know, today I, I think that the church has fallen, in a lot of cases, fallen a, lot, a long way from God. I don't know if I could just sit down and write 95 things, that I, problems I see with the church. That's a lot. That is a lot. Um, but from that, from that the Reformation, we got two great things, um, especially, and there were many others, but two great things that were recovered because truth had been lost. And there were two great truths that were recovered in Scripture and that had been buried under the mounds and mounds and mounds of ritual and false teaching. And the first of those is, is the supreme authority of Scripture over all human authority. What does that mean? That means it's over the authority of the Pope. It's over the, the authority of our church leadership group here. It's over, it is higher than the authority of a pastor, a Bible college teacher, Scripture has authority over all of that. Now, we can say, okay, that means that if I disagree with the person over me, that I have the right to not listen to them anymore or to break fellowship. And we're going to see here that there is a balance that always comes with this because I personally do not know all truth. The Bible teaches that I see us through a glass darkly. But when we're standing before the Lord, it'll be face to face. We will know him as he knows us. But right now, I don't know everything. And there's a balance, and I'm going to show you another one later on. But there's a balance between what we would call truth and the unity of the body of Christ. We know that it is God's will that the body of Christ be of what one accord, right? That they were all in one accord. That's the will of God. And that we don't compromise truth. 
Does this mean we all agree with each other on everything all the time? I can say I have never seen that happen, ever. We will agree on the main portions of things, and we will agree with the, on the authority of the Word of God. There may be peripheral issues that we don't agree on. And what's the, what's the saying, and correct me if I get this wrong, but in the cardinal doctrine, or the important things, the essentials, we have unity. And I, I feel like we have that here. In the essential things, in peripheral issues, we have liberty. But in all things, we have charity. And that's a principle that will bring balance to the body of Christ. Because at some point, as if I depart from truth, the unity of the church will be compromised as there will be someone who will say to me, Pastor Paul, what you're teaching now, what you're taking a stand on now, is not truth. It is very definitely against the word of God. And I can no longer fellowship with this. And unity will be compromised for the sake of truth. But God's will in the body of Christ is that there be a balance between unity and truth that will be bound together in love. So the authority of Scripture was recovered through the Reformation period because the church at that point didn't believe that Scripture had that authority, that Scripture was the inerrant words and thoughts of God. And our churches are returning to that false belief today. Many, many, many of them are compromising Scripture to the point that a true Christian cannot have unity with them anymore. The second truth is that sinful human beings stand justified before God not on the basis of any righteousness of their own doing, but only on the basis of Christ. Crucified, risen, and righteous. The only way we get to heaven or that we stand justified before God is because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. As I said, we go out, knock on doors, and you ask people, Christians, are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a believer. I was saved when I was three years old or whatever. And you'll get a testimony from someone. And you ask them the question, if you were to stand before God, you know, we ask them, do you believe Jesus is the Savior? Yes, I believe Jesus is the Savior. If you were to stand before God, and he said, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say to him? And most of the time people say anything besides the Savior. They talk about, well, I am a good person. I have done the best that I can. And they never seem to make a connection. And I shouldn't say never, but they usually do not make a connection between Jesus as the Savior and the actual act of saving them. They have never yet personalized that I am going to go to heaven for one and only one reason. And that's because Jesus paid for my sin. And I have received this free gift from him. This, that's the second truth through the Reformation that was recovered. And these two recoveries, they're called the formal principle of the Ref Reformation. The truth of the authority of the word and the truth of of the justification by grace alone through faith based on Jesus Christ alone. So what does this look like when we stray from God's word? Or what does this mean that we are saved by Christ alone? I am saved by Christ alone. Well, in 1 Peter 3.20, and I'll read 21 through 20, uh, 20 through 22. We see an example of what this looks like when we are saved by Christ alone. In 1 Peter 3.20 it says, which sometimes were disobedient when 
Once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, when the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. This was a time when the Bible says few be to find the way. Eight people this time. The figure, the like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Now I want to say something here because if you go into a baptismal regeneration church almost every time, and I've been a few times, when you take their little flyer, like the flyer we hand out, you're going to see that little portion of Scripture, that partial portion, the figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. But now let's take a complete look here and see how we can error very easily. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, what this said in 1 Peter 3.20 is that the example that we have of Christ being our salvation is like Noah and the ark, where eight people were put into the ark and being inside the ark were safely born on top of the water. The water held up the ark and they were safe inside the ark from drowning. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. The interesting thing is that the eight people who were saved were the eight who were not in the water. But the problem we get into, get, have with this is that we don't understand what baptism truly is. We think of baptism being put in water. And that is a picture of baptism being immersed into the water. The actual baptism of the believer is being immersed in Christ. Being put in Christ Jesus. The same way that the eight were put inside the ark. The water gives a perfect portrayal of this. A perfect testimony of the immersion, the way we are totally immersed in water. And that the water, if we relax in the water, will even carry us. That being inside the ark, being safe, and it carries us. The same way that being in Christ, we are saved. So, moving on to Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6. We just laid a little bit of foundation there. And I'm going to read this from the King James, because frankly, I read it from another version, and it seemed a little softened up to me, that it, didn't, it, it missed a little bit of the, the true meaning, I felt like. And so I wanted to go back to the, the King James and read from there. But Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verse 3. And I'm going to read verse 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Get that? In Christ. When you are in Christ, you're safe, you're saved. And you receive spiritual blessings. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. According to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now there are some things in that scripture that would make us say, wow, I don't know if I can just readily agree with that. Or maybe I don't understand it. 
And I've heard people say, well, this predestination thing, I just can't believe in it. But the Bible teaches it. And it's not that we are not to believe it, but it's that we are to understand it. Because here we are heading, in, heading into something else that requires a balance. Predestination says what? God is sovereign. He's in control of everything. And the ones who would go to an extreme on it and would say, okay, so God, before the foundation of the world, he said, okay, I have this person here that will be saved. You, okay, you, you will be saved. You, and that's not at all what predestination means. It's not, it's a very bad representation of what predestination means because when we believe that, we have then violated the free will of man, which we know is one of the one of the divine institutions that God gave me. God has given me free will to make godly choices. And so on one hand, I have to think of the sovereignty of God, but that has to be balanced with a divine institution that has been instituted by God of my free will to make choices. Because if I was chosen for destruction before the foundation of the world, then where would be my choice to place my faith in Christ? How do we balance these things? And I can say that an understanding of this, as I understand, would be as this, that Christ is the vehicle in which, like the ark, that we are to receive salvation and go to heaven. You see, if I have a boat like the ark, and it has a destination, okay, we're taking this ship and we're going to the Caribbean islands. And the destination of this is sure. It is predestined, as Christ was predestined, to return to heaven to be with the Father and be seated on the right hand of the Father. That was his sure destination. There was no way that was not going to come to pass. And I enter into a predestined plan to be in Christ Jesus. And once I have entered into that predestined plan, I use my free will to accept this gift that God has given me. I am predestined to become conformed to the likeness of Christ Jesus. Does this make sense to anyone? Understand that we enter into the one who is predestined to go to heaven. I'm not born to be, to go to heaven or to go to hell. But I enter into the predestined plan of Christ that in Christ Jesus I am forever secure. You see, when we walk away from truth and we compromise truth, we enter into a way of living that we begin feeling like our lives are going nowhere. Have you ever wondered why when Israel began to depart from truth, they began, they, they began to reach out to idols and set up idols. Why? Because they enter into a life and a lifestyle that they feel like they're going nowhere. Nothing's being accomplished. It's a sad way to live. And what happens when someone enters into a lifestyle or they begin to believe that their life is insignificant and they're going nowhere? They're accomplishing nothing. They have nothing to look forward to. No goals that go beyond this natural life. Alexander Campbell had a debate, and I've shared this before, with an atheist that was from Great Britain. And as they, he had come from England to debate Alexander Campbell, and he, they were both famous for their debates. And as they're walking across Alexander Campbell's farm, 
they, the, the atheist was telling Anders, Alexander Campbell, he said, you know, as an atheist, we've accomplished something that you Christians have not accomplished in that I have no fear of death. I have no apprehension about a hereafter because I don't believe that the one exists. Therefore, I live my life, I live my life without any worries, and I can eat and I can drink. And as they're walking across the farm, Alexander said, Campbell said, you see my cow there? It's eating grass, drinking water, and it's not worried at all that one day I will take it to the butcher shop. And he said, really, you've only accomplished what my cow has already accomplished. When we are aware that our lives are going nowhere, it's like truly our lives have no meaning. We are not made to live without a destiny. The Bible tells us what? Without a vision, what happens to people? We perish. We perish with no, with no vision. We have to have a destiny. When, our connect, when that connection breaks down, one of three things can happen. I can take my own life because my life no longer has value. Or many people numb themselves with alcohol, drugs, TV, pornography, romance nozzle, novels, or computer or frantic work. Someone who you can't tear away from the workplace. Or frantic play. And we see in our culture today People are addicted to entertainment or to work or to drugs or to alcohol. But there is so much that is there to take the place of having a destiny in Christ. Or the final thing I can do, I can seek to reestablish that connection by finding out what my true destiny is. Like Martin Luther did. And he actually put it down on paper as he wrote down what his purposes and his destiny was in giving authority again to the work of God. Here's an illustration of what happens when people have no hope. And this is from an account, as a matter of fact, it was um, Charles Colson from his book, Kingdoms in Conflict. And he wrote of a happening, he said, in a Nazi concentration camp in Hungary during the Second World War, prisoners were forced to do nauseating work in a sewage plant. Interestingly enough, I actually did a partial tour of this concentration camp in Budapest. And I didn't even know before that time, this was in 2010, before that time I didn't even know in that there was a concentration camp in Budapest. But the Second World War prisoners were forced to do work in a sewage plant. But it was work, and something was accomplished. Then the plant was destroyed by Allied bombers. So the Nazi officers arranged for the prisoners to shovel sand in the carts and to drag it to the other end of the plant and dump it. The next day, they ordered them to shovel it back in the carts and bring it back where they started, just trying to keep them busy. And so it went for days. Finally, one old man began crying uncontrollably. The guards hauled him away. Another screamed until he was beaten into silence. Then a young man who had survived three years in the camp darted away from the group. The guards shouted for him to stop as he ran toward the electrified fence. The other prisoners cried out, but it was too late. There was a blinding flash and a terrible sizzle noise and a smoke puff from a smoldering flesh. And in the days that followed, dozens of prisoners went mad and ran from their work only to be shot by guards or electrocuted by the fence. You see, without a purpose, without vision, we truly perish. And it may not even be a physical perishing but we will drown and anesthetize ourselves with drugs, alcohol, work, 
being on the computer or in front of the TV 24 hours a day or as much as possible. But let's look into this scripture that we just, and, and some real meaning in the scripture that we just shared. In verse 4, it says that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. What is this? This is the general, the general call of God that we are. Before the foundation of the world, God had a plan to redeem mankind. He didn't have a plan for redeeming angels, fallen angels. But he redeemed, planned to redeem mankind. Before the, he even formed the world, there was a plan in, plan in place to redeem me. That whosoever will come would be saved whosoever will come so what is the goal of our destiny first let's focus our attention on what is the goal of our destiny what are we destined for what is God's plan for me what is God's will for my life what is my destiny the first thing is in verse 5 says God predestined us for sonship our destiny before the creation of the world was to become children of God remember that little song and a scripture that we just sing that we may be called the sons of God behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we may become the sons of God. Our destiny is to become children of God. Now what does that mean to be children of God? It means in practicality that I begin, begin to look like my father. Now I look a little bit like my father, my natural father. Not as much as David does, but I do look a bit like my father. We take on a family resemblance when we enter into our destiny to become sons and daughter of God. When God chose you, he had a purpose. And so he predestined that purpose to come about, namely, that you would become a child of God that whosoever will never violating the free will but that we would take on a family likeness another thing that he predestined is that we would be holy and blameless in love in love as we look back into verse for according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love before him in love we see the lord causes us to increase and abound in love one for another for all men so that he may establish our hearts blameless in holiness before God our Father. So let's look at four things here. Four parallels that we have between 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13 and the scripture that we read in Ephesians 4. The first one is, and we know that it's extra important when it's said twice. What have we said before? Men especially need to be told things twice. Women might catch it once. Men need to be told twice. So the phrase in love, may God cause you to abound in love. The second thing is the combination of blamelessness and holiness, that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. And third parallel is the phrase before God, holiness before God, 
which corresponds to the phrase holy and blameless before him. And the fourth one is the reference to God as our Father, just if we, as we have to focus on sonship. So what is our destiny that we can say to bring this all together now? Our destiny is to live in and walk in love. Our destiny is to, for us to become God's children, to be like him, to be holy, to be blameless, and that is to live in love to each other and to all men and to God our, but our, and to God our Father. And then our highest destiny of all is described in verse 6. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Our highest destiny is to live in our holiness and blameless and our love and our sonship and that they're not an end to themselves. They exist for the greatest of all to the praise of the glory of God's grace. The praise of the glory of God's grace. And I'm going to close with just another thought that if we're trusting in Jesus Christ and our lives that the roots of our life will be planted in the eternal counsels of God and the word and then the branches of our lives will grow and will grow into absolute sure and glorious future with God I'm not going to have to be depressed about a dead-end life or a dead-end job because I know that if I'm living in Christ there are no unimportant days in my life there are no unimportant minutes in my life and God chose me and we can personalize this that he chose me each and every one of us before the foundation of the world, that we might be holy and blameless before him in love. Because whosoever will receive, this is the destiny of that person.